surprising that he knows more about the international relations of human rights than just about anybody. He's done a lot of different kinds of research in this uh, area. He also knows the whole area of international relations. He's a staff professor of international affairs here at, at Humphrey, and he also has an appointment at the Department of Political Science in the College of Liberal Arts. Over the years, and I think back to um, Jim's job talk, which was several years ago now, uh, he, he, he talks about the way outsiders affect uh, the perceptions of human rights in developing societies and how governments react, how local people react. And he's done all kinds of survey work in this area, uh, some of which he'll talk about. One of the topics he plans to talk about today is the global crackdown on civil society patterns and causes, which is something he's been working on uh, recently. He heads uh, our activities in human rights here at the Humphrey School, and we're delighted that he was willing to join us today. So thank you for coming, Jay. Thank you, Bob. Um, as many of you probably know, um, there's a crackdown that's been taking place over the last 10 to 15 years on civil society around the world. This is the stage two of what was a, a, a grand expansion in civil society organizations beginning in the 1980s and really accelerating in the 1990s with the end of the Cold War. So the pendulum swang, swung towards uh, building more and more NGOs and more and more civil society organizations on a wide variety of uh, progressive social topics in the 80s and 90s. And then governments began to perceive the power of these organizations, the discursive power of these organizations, and sometimes the financial power of these organizations, and they had begun pushing back. Here you have an article written about this about a year ago by the director of Human Rights Watch, Ken Roth. This was the, the number one issue for him when he uh, talked about the annual report for Human Rights Watch in 2016, what he called the Great Civil Society Chokeout. Um, this is uh, data that comes from a project that uh, my colleagues Asim Prakash and Kendra Dupuy have published recently in uh, World Development. Where we tracked the number of organizations between the number of countries between 1992 and 2012 that imposed new and harsher restrictions on funding to civil society groups operating domestically within their own borders. And so, as you can see, prior to about 1996, prior to 1993, there was only six countries in the world that had formal restrictions on the books about how those groups could get funding from from abroad. By the end of our period of, of discussion in 2012, um, there were 45 countries that had placed new restrictions. And since 2012, which is when we stopped collecting the data, about seven or eight more countries have passed new restrictions, and many more are discussing those. Um, some of the, the kind of archetypical uh, restriction laws that have been passed are Russia's laws about foreign funding, which have stopped the foreign funding of local NGOs by some donor, some specific donors, um, but have also made it um, obligatory on NGOs in Russia to declare the extent to which they receive foreign funds and to self-identify as foreign agents. Uh, another signature law, which my colleagues and I wrote about, took place in 2010 in Ethiopia, in which the government said that of the many tens of thousands of NGOs that are in Ethiopia, local NGOs for the most part, those that work on issues such as human rights, gender, ethnic relations, can have no more than 10% of their budget be contributed to by international donors. Anyone over that um, has to register in a different way as a foreign agent, and there are going to be severe restrictions placed on their activities. You basically cannot work on human rights issues in your country if you get more than 10% of your funding from overseas. Now, interestingly, the governments have been cracking down on the foreign aid, and some, left, some of us left-wing scholars who have been writing about foreign aid have reached the same point in many ways. Many of us have felt that beginning in the 1990s, the amount of aid that was being passed from the OECD countries to NGOs and civil society more broadly in the Global South was becoming excessive. It was becoming excessive in that more and more organizations were popping up um, to do work that really wasn't very good. They were just popping up to attract funding. These are called briefcase NGOs. 
they tend to take place in, in heavily, in poorly regulated environments, uh, Africa and elsewhere, but wherever the government is, is not able to exert strong control over the regulatory environment for society groups, then you have these entrepreneurs that open up NGOs in order to soak up foreign cash. But I think the bigger problem was that the best organizations, which had developed in the past large local bases of volunteers and of supporters and of constituents, were gradually relinquishing those local ties in favor of the foreign funds that were coming to them. And it became increasingly clear that it was easier to get foreign funds for some types of organizations, for the most successful organizations, than it was to do the hard work of mobilizing domestic constituencies. And so over time, by the year 2012, we had more and more organizations that had really no local constituencies, but, uh, but, but a, a series of international patrons, such as the Ford Foundation, the Norwegian government, the US government, the UN, and so forth and so on. And this became a severe weakness for the global civil society um, arena, and one that governments soon realized was available to them as a lever to control uh, domestic civil society in their countries. It turns out that it's much, much easier to control NGOs when they're funded from abroad because all the money comes in through uh, two or three individual banks and you can very easily shut off those flows or regulate those flows in a way that you can if the organization is funded by a plethora of local volunteers and local members who bring small donations. If you, get, if you depend heavily on six or seven foreign donors, that money can be just stopped off uh, in the capital with just a flick of a switch. You don't even need to be a strong state in order to do that. You can be a weak state, but you can still wreak havoc on the local NGO population. And that's indeed what took place in Ethiopia in 2010. The new law was passed. We visited in 2012 and found that of organizations that had self-identified as human rights organizations, the number had dropped from 157 to 12. And of those 12 that were still in operation, most of them had drastically cut back on their activities. So Ethiopia was perhaps an extreme case, but the phenomenon is widespread across, um, across the global south. And as uh, a team that I've been working with, um, Andrea Martinez is here from Mexico, knows the same is true in Mexico as well. Um, Andrea spent all summer in Mexico working with a group of NGO, human rights NGOs that we had identified. Um, the vast majority of them were heavily dependent on foreign funds from the states <coughs> of Europe. And very few of them had any sense of how to raise local money and we were trying to work with them to see if we could help them do that. So what are the, the predictors of these crackdowns? So we know that the number, of, the number of countries who restricted increased from 6 to 45, and now it's probably up towards 52 or 55, but what are the really actual triggers of those crackdowns? We modeled this uh, statistically, controlling for a wide variety of factors, and we found two factors that really helped boost the crackdown. One was overall flows of outside money. That is, the more your country received foreign aid, as measured in the OECD Development Assistance Committee database, the more likely you were to have a crackdown on aid. And that stands to reason. There's more money flowing in, so the stakes are higher for governments. Governments are, are more worried because there's, there's, there's more cash running around their country. And they're not controlling that cash, at least of portions of it. The other factor um, we didn't anticipate, and it was the existence of a nationally competitive election up to one year prior to the crackdown. So if your country had experienced either a legislative or an executive um, event that was contested, that was truly contested, and it took place 12 months prior to the crackdown, your elevation, your, your risk of having a, 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 a restrictive law was much elevated. And the risk really skyrocketed when you interacted those two things. When you interacted high levels of foreign aid, and a recent national election, you had a much elevated probability of a restriction on foreign aid. The logic to that, I think, is as follows. <clears throat> Prior to an election, if it's truly competitive, and there is a lot of international aid there, the gov a government might be worried about cracking down on, on civil society because it could threaten their um, success in the elections. But once the elections are over, the government has a window of opportunity that it can use, it has a mandate, and so it can quickly move to crack down on the NGOs that were so difficult for them during the run-up to the election. During the run-up to the election, NGOs published a lot of information on 
misbehavior by the government. That information was then used by the political opposition in the national election. And the government says, okay, we're going to have another election again in four to six or eight years. Now is the window of opportunity just after the election where I can crack down on the foreign funding that was so pernicious to my control over the country. And so we're able to tell donors two things. One, sending in more money to help civil society is not necessarily a good way uh, to protect civil society from a crackdown. In fact, it appears to raise the risk. And two, you have to be especially wary of that 12-month period after a nationally competitive election. Worry less about the 12 months prior to the election, but worry about the 12 months after, when a more authoritarian government may have won the election and now turns to restrictions that it wants to put in place for the next round, for the next competitive electoral round. Okay, so that's the crackdown. Um, what we asked in a book that we're publishing, this book right now, uh, with Oxford University Press, it's coming out in the next few weeks, is what is the role of public opinion in this great civil society chokeout? Do ordinary people support human rights uh, oriented NGOs? And are governments cracking down on NGOs because public opinion is driving in that direction? Or because uh, in spite of public opinion, that is they're going against public opinion? Can local human rights organizations replace some of that foreign aid with local money? And, and those are the three questions that we are dealing with in this presentation. What is the role of public opinion in this crackdown? Is it because of or in spite of? The existing evidence, it turns out, is very, very sparse. We have a number of case studies, including from um, Catherine Sinking, who used to teach here at the university and has left us, but is still emeritus here at the Department of Political Science. She did a number of individual case studies that showed that there was a fair bit of popular support for NGOs in the countries that she looked at, mostly in Latin America. We have a, a number of pessim more pessimistic scholars, however, uh, many of them anthropologists, who point to the rent-seeking, selfish behavior of some NGOs that I mentioned earlier. Foreign-funded NGOs that receive um, easy international money and therefore do not develop the ties of accountability and respect and consideration that they need to for, for their co-citizens. Um, one of the most prominent pessimists is a guy called Harry England. He's an anthropologist teaching um, at Cambridge in, in the UK. And he studied this one very large NGO in Malawi that received a lot of international aid. And he traveled around with them all across the country. And to read his book um, is to think of this NGO, this human rights NGO, as nothing but a cynical, manipulative group of status-sinking young men and women who use the NGO and its logos and its expense accounts and its per diems to lord over the peasant population and to portray themselves as great saviors connected to um, foreign experts and foreign discourses and foreign money. And if you read this book, you can conclude nothing other than these NGOs must be totally and utterly hated, despised by the populations that they say that they're trying to support. So we have really a lack of evidence. We have two strong theoretical claims and then everything in the middle. Theoretical claim number one is the people love human rights NGOs because human rights NGOs represent their interests and are fighting for them. Hypothesis number two is the people hate NGOs because they see through their crass, cynical, manipulative behavior and really know them to be nothing other than opportunists. So our, the interviews, the, the evidence that we gathered over a period of 10 years is several hundred interviews with um, local human rights workers uh, in over 60 countries. I can talk more about how we gathered the, that information later if that's of interest to you. But what I want to focus on today are what we call the human rights perception polls. It's a series of interviews face-to-face -face interviews that we do with populations around the world. In this particular presentation, I'm going to be talking about four specific countries, but we've done it and we are doing it in other countries with money from a variety of sources. Uh, for today's presentation, I'm talking about 6,100 face-to-face interviews, of representative samples of the general public in specific areas that I will explain. Um, we looked at four cases, Mexico, Morocco, India, and Nigeria. And as you can see, by doing so, we're able to vary on a number of important variables. We're able to vary by world region. We're able to vary by major religion. 
by colonial history, civilization, and by ma major languages. The civilization uh, idea comes from Sam Huntington. Some of you may be familiar with that argument. That argues that civilizations are like uh, are, are kind of a culturally coherent actor that have an identity above and beyond that of the state. So our four countries are not just randomly chosen four countries. They're, cho they're countries that are very uh, carefully chosen to represent four distinct regions, uh, civilizations, colonial histories, and so forth and so on. So if we find any similarities in these four countries, we have evidence of a trend that's more than just these four countries. It may be of a global trend. Okay, so that's a way of, um, of selecting cases when you can only study in depth a small number of cases, you select them in such a way that you can try and generalize a little bit more than just the four. Okay. Here are some technical details on the polls. Um, in Mexico, the sample size is 2,400. That was the largest because we attached our questions to a broader poll that was being done by our local partner. So we omnibused our survey into their poll. But in other parts of the world, um, we tended to be uh, about, at about the 1,500, 1,000 to 1,500 size uh, of sample. And we sampled, in everywhere but Mexico, we sampled major cities, major urban areas with their surrounding rural environments. So we're able statistically to explore the effect of being rural or being urban on your views, but we don't have the data from the whole country. Just to give you um, an explanation of why this is so, it's entirely financial. Um, to, to sample all of Morocco would cost us $45,000. To sample just Rabat and Casablanca and a sampling of the rural areas within a 70 kilometer arc around those two cities, the cost was only $24,000. So when you multiply that times four, it becomes clear that um, you need substantial resources to do it at the national level. We now, as a, re as a result of doing these city studies, we now have the money to do it at the national level, but we first had to have proof of concept. Okay, what do the leaders of NGOs say, local human rights organizations? Their argument is that they're, they're quite pessimistic. In fact, many of them subscribe to that anthropologist Harry England uh, view of, of NGOs. They think the population finds it hard to understand the words human rights, that many people regard them as agents of foreigners, many people regard them as supporters of terrorists or of criminals, and therefore somehow opposed to the general interest, general will, and Many believe that there's a constituency in cities that is better educated, more wealthy, and is basically the global middle class. Okay, so that's what NGOs think. And I think if, if, many, if we pull people, many people around this room, I think we find a fair number of people who think the same thing. That there's a global middle class that is pro-NGO, pro-human rights, and that everybody else is against. So what did we find? First of all, we looked at contact. This goes to that issue that I, that I talked about, do NGOs have good local ties? Do they have extensive relationships with constituencies? And what the numbers here show is that in fact, um, no they don't. Um, here we asked, have you ever in your life met someone who you consider to be a human rights worker? We asked 6,100 people that question. And the average was about 8% said yes, they thought they had met someone like that. We don't even know what they were thinking of. They might have been thinking about a government worker, they might have been thinking about a fireman, I don't know. But when they searched into their brain and they thought about, have I ever met somebody who I think is a human rights worker, it was only about 8% on average. When we asked them, can you name a specific NGO that defends human rights in your country? Again, the numbers were pretty low. Only 7% said yes, I can name. We then asked those people, Okay, what's the name? And the numbers are much, much lower of those who accurately named anything. A lot of people just said things like the Human Rights Organization or the UN or something like that. But once you, you, you really look at the answers, you realize that the, the name recognition of prominent NGOs in these four countries the average is probably around 2%. And then we asked, did you ever participate in the activities of anything you thought was the activity of the Human Rights Organization? And the response to that was 5% on average. But again, the real number has got to be a lot lower because we don't know what people were thinking about when we asked them that. They could have been talking about signing a petition for something that had nothing to do with human rights. right? So these are just a first cut at trying to get a sense to what extent are these NGOs embedded in society. And one of the measures of embeddedness is do people know of you? Can they name you? Can they, have they ever met you? 
and the and, and, and name recognition and, and contact is quite low. We then tried to get at what people associated with the terms human rights. And the reason why we chose the, the language human rights is because so much of the NGO discourse is based on the human rights discourse. Even if it might be economic, uh, the, the NGO might be economic or gender oriented or oriented towards migrant labor or towards sex workers, the human rights discourse is always the discourse that underlays it and underpins it rhetorically and discursively. So we wanted to know what people associated with the terms human rights. The pessimists would say that people would associate human rights with all kinds of negative things. The optimists would say, no, people associate human rights with, with positive things. You can think about human rights as the brand of many NGOs. And here what we're doing is we're asking people, what kind of reputation does the NGO brand have? Okay. Uh, the, the questions were ranged from one least strongly to seven most strongly, with four being the neutral point. So we say, to what extent do you, do you associate uh, human rights with the following phrase? And we read out a phrase. And those phrases were taken from things that the, the NGO leaders had told us that they thought the population thought about them. And if somebody really associated human rights with that phrase, they said seven. If they did not associate it, they said one. So here are what we call the positives, the things that human rights activists would hope that people associate with their brand. Protecting women's rights, protecting people from torture and murder, protect, promoting socioeconomic justice, and promoting free and fair elections. And as you can see, almost all the countries and all the averages are in the positive side of the scale. That is, they're all past number four. One is down here, seven is here, and in all cases, the positive associations with the words human rights outweigh the negative associations. So that is one piece of evidence in favor of the optimists rather than the pessimist. If Harry England, the anthropologist, was right, we should have seen the bars all down here. People did not associate it with these things, they associated it with the next things which we're going to talk about. Next we have the idea of human rights being associated with foreign domination or foreign influence or foreign penetration, some kind of foreign threat. And we asked, do you associate human rights with promoting foreign values and ideas, or do you associate it with promoting U.S. interests? And again, as you can see, all the countries, and the averages, of course, are below the four mid-scale. So people do associate human rights with that term, but not very strongly. Much less strongly than with the positive things. And that is another mark in favor of the pessimistic, the optimistic view of the way in which the world is structured. And finally, we have a battery of really negative associations. Human rights is not protecting or promoting anyone's interests. Human rights is about protecting criminals or it's about protecting terrorists. And again, you can see that the averages are much lower for these three. So if you look at the whole picture and you're an NGO person, you say, huh, this look actually looks pretty good. It looks like Catherine Sinkick's view might be true and Harry England is wrong. Because people tend to have more positive than negative associations with the brand that NGOs tend to use, brand human rights. Okay, next we asked, how much do you trust human rights organizations? And the question specifically was, please tell me, how much trust do you place in the following institutions, groups, or persons? A lot of trust, some, a little, or none at all. And we rescaled it for methodological reasons to zero to one. Because in some of the surveys we asked a seven point scale, so we, we uh, put everything on the zero to one scale. <clears throat> and again, if you're a pessimist, there's gonna be a lot of mistrust. And if you're an optimist, there's gonna be a lot of trust, right? And interestingly, this question had never been asked about human rights organizations. This is a standard question that's asked about everything from Congress to your grocery store, but it had never been asked about human rights organizations. So before we were investigating brand human rights, now we're investigating producer human rights, the NGO itself. And we find that trust in NGOs that, that do human rights work is moderately high. This is trust in politicians. These are the four countries, and the black is the average. As you can see, trust in politicians is the lowest across all our four countries, whereas trust in religious institutions is the highest. But local human rights organizations, right here, are at the upper end of the revealed trust spectrum. The revealed trust spectrum is basically the distance between the average highest, which is here, and the average lowest, which is here. And as you can see, it's it's a little bit 
higher than 0 0.5. It's a little bit towards the upper end. And what's important is that LHROs are in the top third of the revealed trust, trust spectrum. So people don't totally mistrust, and they don't totally trust. This is where they, most of the action is. And in the area where most of the action is, human rights groups average out towards the middle upper third. So again, another point in for, the pes for the optimists and a point against the pessimists. This is not as resounding as, as maybe an optimist would like. An optimist would like NGOs to be, the average score to be not 0.52, but closer to 0.64, because many NGO people think themselves superior to religious institutions. But the reality is, that's not where they're at. They're doing a lot better than politicians. They're doing a lot better than the US government. They're doing better even than the general population. They're slightly better, and this difference is statistically significant. They're doing better than multinational corporations, but they're not doing as well as religious institutions in their own country. Okay, so now we're going to have a couple hypotheses that we threw out of the literature, threw out from the literature and from the in interviews with the NGO leaders, and we decided to, to try and test them on the data. The first hypothesis was that people would see human rights NGOs as extensions of U.S. power. This is an argument that's made often in the Middle East, but not only in the Middle East, that because NGOs receive a lot of money from USAID or from the UN, which itself is supported by the US government, that NGOs are really Trojan horses for foreign forces in general and for the US in particular. If that's true, then we should expect mistrust in local human rights organizations to be positively associated with mistrust in the US government. If you mistrust the US government, you mistrust the NGOs. On the other hand, if you think of human rights organizations as somehow an extension of global capitalism, and there is that argument that's out there, that what NGOs are really doing is by spreading this kind of liberal individualistic ideology, they're preparing the ground for a market society, a market economy, which will allow um, public utilities to be broken up, which will allow unions to be broken up, and will make private property um, more respected. And so really it's part of a global capitalist agenda. If that's true, then mistrust in local human rights organizations should be correlated positively with mistrust in multinational corporations. You don't like multinational corporations, you should also not like local human rights organizations. Another argument that's out there is that human rights groups have become too closely identified with the, with the established authorities. They're getting money from foreign donors, they're working closely with governments, they're too cozy with governments, they really are extension of the government and they are not seen as representing the, the people and the, and the popular will and the popular interest. And in that case, mistrust in LHROs should be positively associated with mistrust in domestic authorities. Okay? Now, the optimistic, these are all pessimistic, right? These are all that view <coughs> human rights organizations as being bad in one way or another. The optimistic one says that human rights organizations are in fact leading the struggle against multinationals, against U.S. domination, and against uh, abuses by domestic authorities. That's the, past, the, 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 the optimistic reading, that these are NGOs that are fighting for the popular will against concentrated power. In that case, trust in LHROs should be positively associated with mistrust in those three actors. Okay, is the logic clear? Okay. Now, Note that what we're going to be doing is we're asking how this is reflected in people's attitudes. We're not asking whether this is actually the case. We don't know if NGOs actually are working for the U.S. government and are actually um, front organizations for the CIA. They might be. This research methodology can't tell us that. All this research methodology can do is tell us whether people think that. Now, if you believe that NGOs are really CIA agents, but that people don't see that at all, then you have to believe that somehow the NGOs and the CIA have managed to fool large numbers of people for a fairly large amount of time. And that's kind of a false consciousness argument, which we tend to shy away from. We tend to uh, regard people as foolable, but not so gullible that they would be so fundamentally misinformed about the nature of NGOs. But again, I'm not able to actually comment on whether NGOs are agents of capitalism. All I can say is whether people think they are agents of capitalism. Remember, because that's the research question. Okay. 
So we ran a bunch of statistical models. They're very simple statistical models. We do OLS regression. We also check it in OLogic, um, but the results are the same. And these results are robust to four years of tinkering uh, by four authors, each with varying preoccupations and obsessions. Our dependent variable is trust in local human rights organizations, ranged on, the, ranged on the zero to one scale. Our independent variables of interest are mistrust in the US, in multinational corporations, and in domestic authorities. We have a variety of controls. I won't go through all of them, but they control for the things that you think might also be important, such as how much are you exposed to human rights ideas? What do you know? Can you recognize human rights organizations? Um, how much do you trust people in general? Not just how much do you trust these organizations. What is your average trust in institutions? Um, what is your age, what is your income, your education, your gender, and so forth and so on. So we control for a bunch of things, but our variables of interest, the independent variables of interest are the mistrust in US, multinational corporations, and domestic authorities. Okay? Any questions about this? Jim, I just wanted to ask you a question about the LHROs. You presented data earlier showing how few people have ever even heard of... You know, specific ones. Specific ones. But then, but, but, do you have a view about what people mean by the trust in... Right, so we have a pa apparent paradox here, and it's not similar to the paradox, if you were to ask an, an ordinary American citizen, can you name, name as many congressmen or congresswomen as you can? The average American would name probably about two, three, four. If you were to ask an American, name all the accountants that you know. The average American would say, you know, would name two or three accountants that they work with. But if you were to ask them, what do you think of accountants, or what do you think of Congress, they're going to have a view. Because we form expectations and opinions about actors that we hear a lot about, even when we don't know the individuals. Just like people have opinions about African Americans, or Jews, or whites, right? We have opinions about collectivities, even if some of us, when pressed, realize that we don't actually know very many individual units of that collectivity. So here, I think, is what we're doing. We're getting, we're capturing the sum total of the vector, of the vectors that they have received through the national media over the last 10, 15 years, as governments have cracked down more and more, and as the debate over NGOs has increased, what are their general perceptions of the words human rights organizations in your country? Local. Yeah, we, I say the word here, local, but what we say to people is human rights, Moroccan human rights organizations. Moroccan. Yeah, and we have a separate question on international human rights organizations operating in Morocco. Okay? All right, so here is three years of work distilled into one visual. <laughs> um, it took a really long time to come up with this. And basically what it shows you is that the counter-hegemonic thesis is right. I'll go back to that slide. It shows you that this is true. It shows you that trust in LHROs is positively associated with mistrust in the US government, in multinational corporations, and in domestic authorities. Okay, and we, for those of you who are into statistics, I'll spend a little time dwelling on this graph. Um, what this shows you here is the level of respondent mistrust. Here is low respondent mistrust. Here is high respondent mistrust in each one of these things in the US government, in multinational corporations, and in domestic political authorities. Each one of these is represented by a different line, dash dotted in solid. Here is trust in local human rights organizations ranged from a minimum of zero to a maximum of one. And as you can see, the lines slope up here. I don't have the confidence intervals for those of you who are statistical geeks, and that's because if you had three confidence intervals for three lines, it would be very messy. But these are all statistically significant um, functions. And what this shows is that the more you mistrust each one of these, the more you trust HROs. Okay? So it goes back to this right here. And it says, H1, it's not true. People do not think, in the four countries that we looked at, people do not think that human rights organizations are agents of U.S. influence. H2, they do not think that they're extensions of global capitalism as represented by multinational corporations. And H3, they do not think of them extensions of the ruling establishment. Instead, H4 is correct. They think of them as pitched against these three sources of concentrated power at the international political, international economic, and domestic political level. Okay, so that is a resounding <coughs> vote in favor of the optimists. 
And let me just say that before I started the project, my mission in life was to prove the optimist wrong. <laughs> I was brought here six years ago. Sorry that Bob's not here. I was brought here six years ago as the anti-sick ink. Catherine Sick Inc. Was the, was the optimist of, of, of global repute who resided in the political science department. And she was kind enough to allow me to be hired. And she could have easily blocked it because she said, I totally disagree with everything that Jim Ron represents and is trying to do, but he's a worthy opponent, so I'm perfectly happy to have him here on faculty. In fact, I welcome it. And everyone thought, thought of that as this amazing tolerance by this towering scholar where she's like, this guy has spent his whole life nipping at my heels trying to show me wrong, uh, that I'm wrong. Of course, I'm much younger than her and much less famous. And that's perfectly fine with me. The level of his work is good enough that you know I'm happy to have him in the department. And so I came here six years ago without any of this public opinion data. There were resources here that I was able to leverage. Leverage is a stupid word. There was resources here that I was able to use to do the, the surveys, and I found that she was right. And then she, before I was able to fully find that she was right, she left. <laughs> and, and so I've never really been able to deliver this presentation to her, but I did send her the book before it got published, and she was one of the reviewers, and she wrote some nice things about it. Um, so what does this tell us? Well, first of all, let me talk about these three constituencies. We said, what we showed in the previous graph is there are three distinct groups that are pro-human rights groups and opposed to concentrated power. These are those who mistrust the U.S. government, those who mistrust multinational corporations, and those who mistrust domestic political authorities. 65% <coughs> of the population on average mistrust domestic authorities, 62% mistrust multinational corporations, and 57% mistrust the U.S. government. However, the overlap between them is only 36%. There's only 36% of the population that feels strongly about all three. What this shows you is that the constituencies for human rights groups are multiple and not identical. And that requires an, an NGO community that is much more versatile and much more savvy about messaging to different audiences than they're normally um, accustomed to doing. NGOs, if any of you know NGOs, you know that they're particularly bad at being political operators. They don't adjust their messages. They don't research uh, their constituents. They just set them on a principle that their founder or the, the founding collective decided was important, and then they just hammer that point home again and again and again and again. They don't try and be political in the sense of trying to understand how their message resonates with this group and not with that group, and therefore to adjust it the way politicians do. And that is, of course, a strength, but it's also a weakness when you're trying to mobilize public support. So what we're able to show here is that they have at least three distinct constituencies which are not identical. What are some other key findings? Well, more support with local human rights organizations is associated <coughs> more contact, excuse me, with local human rights organizations is associated with more trust. If you recall that, that anthropologist, Harry England, if you read his book or you just listened to a talk about what he said, you would think that the more contact there was, the less trust there would be because the groups were so venal, so awful, that the contact should drive down trust. That does not appear to be happening systematically across the four countries that we looked at. Um, we also found that there's no support for the middle class thesis. There's no support that people in the middle income areas are, are consistently pro or anti either human rights brand or human rights producer of the organization. The effects are contradictory across countries. In Morocco, the middle class is more supportive. In India, the middle class is not more supportive. And in Mexico and in Nigeria, class has no um, statistically discernible effect. So there's no uniformly pro-human rights middle class, and most consistent predictors are attitudinal, not socio-demographic. And that's a lesson that I think we're all beginning to learn from the U.S. You know, we, we, we often, when we say, why do people support Trump, we go to demographics, we say, well, whites of a certain kind who live in a certain place, and so forth and so on, and some of that is true. But when you run the regressions, when you look at multiple variables together, Often the things that, pre that predict um, pro-Trump attitudes are other attitudes. Views about God, about country, about the individual, about the collective. And we find that that's true for human rights as well. That the socio-demographic explanations are far less persuasive and less important than, for example, your feelings about the U.S. government or your feelings about your own government. And those things, in turn, are not driven by a consistent set of socio-demographic factors. 
And so the struggle for the heart and soul of people and their views about human rights and about NGOs and about civil society is attitudinal. It's not some kind of socioeconomic war between a rising middle class and everyone else. Okay, so that's, I'm going to stop here. I have more slides that I can show for specific uh, issues. I can also go into religion more because we found that religion was an important driver of some feelings um, about human rights NGOs, but I'll stop for now. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, let, me, let me ask you how these two connect a little bit. Um, local human rights organizations, according to your surveys, are positively viewed. The crackdown is on, relate that to the crackdown. I mean, so the crackdown is, if, if our findings are true beyond these four countries, then there is reason to believe that the crackdown is occurring in spite of public opinion, not because of public opinion. And that therefore there is significant potential to mobilize <laughs> against the crackdown. And paradoxically, the cutoff in foreign aid may provide some organizations with precisely that opportunity. Because deprived of, the foreign, of foreign money, they need to turn to local constituents for time, support, and money. And our statistics suggest that those appeals will fall on more fertile ground than NGOs had hitherto feared. More, but how much more? I mean, are the, I mean, it's, you know, you, we you tried to quantify it. What that response function looks like? Uh, we, we tried to quantify it. Um, by doing an experiment, um, in Mexico, in which we handed out uh, bundles of 50 pesos to 960 individuals randomly selected from the general population. We handed them little bags of 50 pesos and we described a human rights organization to them. And we used four different descriptions to randomly chosen groups. And we said, how much, if any, of these 50 pesos would you donate to, the, to this organization? And you can keep all the money, or you can donate it all, or you can donate part of it. And we gave them the bag, and then our enumerator walked away to give them privacy, and then came back, and the money was placed in a jar with a lot of other money, so it wasn't clear how much that person had given. And then our enumerator walked away. We actually knew how much money was in the jar, so we could count exactly how much <laughs> had been given, but it didn't appear that way to the, the respondent. And so we can quantify it, and we can say that on average, people will give 21, pe 21 pesos um, out of every 50 marginal pesos to a human rights organization, regardless of how we describe it. We can show, however, that when you describe the organization in Mexico as financially transparent and, and heavily audited by respected international and domestic auditors, the, um, the rate of donation jumps up to 26 pesos from the mean. But uh, if you do what most NGOs do, which is you describe a story about an individual who was beaten up by the government and then was badly treated, and so forth and so on, that doesn't actually, that, that does not attract more donations. People are, are not interested in that kind of individual story. What they're interested in is the, is the probity and the financial soundness of the NGO. At least that's in Mexico. We ran the same experiment in Colombia, and unfortunately we did not get statistically significant results. So there's $5,000 out the window, <laughs> um, just in donated money, and, and a year of work out the window. But we asked a bunch of other questions in the survey, so we're able to do other, we're able to salvage the data, but our main thing was the money, and the money didn't work. Um, if you're interested afterwards, I can show a little video that we have about that experiment. Questions or comments? Um, yes, sir. I just wanted to know uh, if uh, the public opinion is also in favor of the uh, human rights organizations, and still government goes after against them against these organizations. Is there any, uh, I mean, qualitative or quantitative kind of data with us that how many people would actually go against the government, stand with the organizations against this crackdown? So we asked a question, um, we started to ask that question towards, the, towards our later interviews. We didn't ask it in the earlier ones, but we, we were confronted by that concern early on, and so we started including the question, um, to what extent would you be willing, if such and such happened, to go out into the street <coughs> um, and to do certain things? And then we, 
what we haven't done is we haven't manipulated the conditions around that. So would you be willing to go out on the street if there were no police? Would you be willing to go out on the street if there were 20 police? Would you be willing to go out on the street if there were 50 police and there were bullets flying? Right? So that's the way you have to do. You have to kind of systematically go through it, and we haven't done that. Instead, we've been experimenting on the donations, not on the participation. Um, I think we came up with about a good 30% thought that they would go out and protest. And that would be a huge number. Um, but we didn't manipulate the conditions enough to know whether that's going to substantially drop, as I would expect it would, once the risk goes up. So we were looking at two, there are two potential responses to the crackdown. One is you go out on the street and you protest for the NGOs. The other one is you donate money to the local NGO because now it's lost its international fund. So we chose that one because we thought that was perhaps less, um, uh, less risky to talk about. I think it would be a good thing to do in the next round. What would you be willing to sacrifice to go out in the street? Have you ever looked into if NGOs start receiving money from the government? Is it actually helping NGOs or is it silencing them? I think the answer to that is not unequivocal. I think it depends on context. Um, there are some contexts, and I'm thinking of Morocco in particular, where civil society has mobilized quite strongly, and they've managed to at least legitimize a narrative that says government money is public money. And so if the government gives us money, that's fine, and we can do with it what we want. There is a strong contingent of, of human rights leaders in Morocco who believe that to be true. Many other places, people believe that to be impossible. In Mexico, we found and correct me if I'm wrong, Andrea, not that people didn't think, not that people thought that getting money from the government would mean that you would have to shut up. It meant, rather, getting money from the government was so bureaucratically difficult and so onerous that they would prefer not to do it. They preferred, whenever possible, to get money from international sources. It depended, it depended on the issue of the NGO. If they were, mm -hmm. like, women's rights, they were, like, people were more open to the idea of the NGO receiving money for it, mm -hmm. from the government. But if they were working on um, death by uh, execution by security forces, then that was another issue entirely. Yeah. So it depends by issue and by government. But I don't think there's a I don't think there's a, there's an unequivocal answer to that question. How volatile do you see the the public opinion responses, given what they were 2012 2013, right? I think when you did our, our surveys, surveys run between 2012 and 2014. Um, the only place where we polled longitudinally is in Mexico. And we find v very little change over time, even though we polled before the Ayotzinapa incident, in which 41 students were kidnapped <coughs> and then killed, and after the Ayotzinapa incident. We did not find a huge effect. We have a small one, but, it, but not one that we were, not what we were looking for. So. It may be that people's, well, I don't want to extrapolate from that one. We need to do more with longitudinal studies to know if it's volatile or not. I think um, in hyper-mobilized countries, such as maybe Russia, <coughs> maybe Israel, um, there's going to be a fair bit of volatility. But in countries where the government hasn't managed to spread its view of things to all corners of society, the volatility may be much reduced. I just would be curious to know how much it would relate to to kind of like, you know, clear per perceptions about the U.S. as, you know, a global leader. Given yeah. when I kind of think about 2012, it's like after the Iraq War, you know, uh, you know, to, to a little extent. I yeah. mean, we don't have an after, but, you know, at least after the beginning, right? And well, then... We do know that, uh, that public opinion towards the United States is volatile, and that it right. changes a lot depending on what the U.S. is doing. So, this is just a snapshot in time here. The, the solid line is mistrust in the U.S. Um, you know, after Trump, I would expect it to be more like this. Right. I mean, this is, this is Obama, right, which for many of us is, is not so bad, right? So, under Trump, I would imagine that the slope of that line is very different. Yes, sir. Just going off a question on uh, the changes over time, like I mentioned, I'm from Kenya, and I, I would like my experience at the time when there was uh, international judicial processes against the current 
leadership, there was perhaps a very high negative perception of uh, human rights kind of organizations because I think the entire country had this kind of thinking that perhaps the local uh, human rights organization had a way of involving the international community into uh, arresting or you know creating all these kind of claims of of uh, heinous crimes against humanity. Now, today, I would imagine that there are different perceptions of the same NGOs depending on the issues they are working on. So my question here is, clearly looking at the data that you are working on, what were the differences perhaps on um, the type of NGOs that you looked at in terms of the issues that they were looking at, in terms mm -hmm. of perception? Like, an NGO is looking at electoral processes and that will only works on uh, international women and rights issues. How would those perceptions change? And then secondly, uh, thinking about NGO perception as, if at all it's positive, then it means that perhaps the local community could rally against the crackdown. I wonder how this would look like in uh, communities where the national political system is actually aligned with the ethnic and local affiliations mm -hmm. uh, within the country. So I'm thinking about Kenya, and I would imagine that Today what's happening, they just have actually cut out you know, NGO crackdown for about 10 of them, international ones. And the uh, majority of the people would not even get to protest against the NGOs because they're looking at the presidency and the communities. And so how do this play hand in hand uh, from your research? Well, the Kenya case is, um, is an outlier because of the international uh, indictment. Okay. The ICC indictment means automatically <laughs> that the stakes around NGOs operating in the human rights space are much, much, much higher. So the same would be true of NGOs in Sudan, the chain, true in Uganda. Um, it would be also true in Israel, where there's been a lot of discussion of um, an ICC uh, indictment against Israeli, especially in the wake of the Goldstone Commission. So I think those cases are, are aside. We didn't look at any countries that had that factor, the ICC indictment. Having said that, a colleague of mine, a graduate of this university, Jeff Dancy, has been polling in Kenya, and he's found strong differences in your support for NGOs and for the, and for, uh, the transitional justice efforts, depending on whether you are a victim or not. Victims of the violence are much more pro-NGOs than non-victims, and also supporters of the ruling party are much more critical of the NGOs than not. These results here are net of political party effects, so we asked people, what party did you vote for? What party do you most support? And then we control for that. And so these are effects that are net of political preferences. But political preferences do drive, sometimes drive a lot of this. It depends on whether the NGOs have become part of the political football. Um, and it depends whether the issue has become part of the political football. So what we saw in Mexico, for example, was um, there's much less support for NGOs working on the problem of forced disappearances than there is for NGOs working on issues of water. Most of the human rights NGOs in Mexico work on forced disappearances, but that issue is very heavily politicized, and the government has made strong counterclaims against NGOs that have come up with arguments against the government. Whereas on water, one, there are not very many NGOs that are working on it, and two, the issue is not heavily contested in the, in the domestic political arena. And so NGOs working on water in Mexico have a much stronger reputation. We looked for these reputational effects between issue areas in Nigeria, and we didn't find any. Um, it may be that the issue of NGOs is just not sufficiently politicized in Nigeria to pick up on this. Other data from Israel, for example, has shown that people are generally supportive of NGOs, but once you add to the question that these are NGOs working on Palestinian issues, the sort support drops precipitously. So I think it depends on issue and on the level of politicization. One thing, Jim, that you've talked about, I'm not sure we have other questions, but, but it might be a good place to inject this because you talk about water and disappearances, and you talk about uh, human rights and civil society. It seems to me that, you know, the, for, for the layman, I think that the, the clarity of some of these concepts is, 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 sometime, is lost. If you were to, for example, try to talk about how important civil society was in the total picture of a certain country, how would you go about trying to measure it? Well, there are people who do that. There's a project in Johns Hopkins University called the Civil Society Project, and they measure the, the contribution to GNP of the, of the third sector, which is NGOs plus other charitable... Input costs. I mean, input costs, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Another way to do that is to, uh, again, this isn't something that I've done, but these are great ideas, uh, great, great questions. And Another would be to look at the number of statements on a particular topic that are attributed to NGOs. Um, and I think you'll find on, say, on women's issues, on sex trafficking, on disappearances in Mexico, whatever the political issue of the day is, you'll find that there is a percentage of that that is sourced in the NGO community, and you can probably watch that change over time. So the kind of contribution to discourse as opposed to the contribution to the country's bottom line. Um, another way of looking at this is uh, if you break international aid to civil society away from aid to the government, and then you divide that by the size of the economy, that's another one. That's similar to the input uh, logic. Um, I think it's safe to say that in some countries, NGOs have become enormously influential in shaping the debate, far more so than political parties. And I think um, the trust that people afford to NGOs, as opposed to politicians, is really interesting. This is a finding that has been found um, for, for NGOs in general. And NGOs in general enjoy much more trust from the general population than politicians do, or the domestic governments. So the brand reputation of civil society is strong enough that they can be thought leaders in a way that politicians in some countries no longer can. I don't think that's true in this country, but, but um, I think it's true in other countries. And I think it might even be true in this country. I think if you think of the role of the NRA and, uh, and Planned Parenthood and so forth, I don't know, I'm not an Americanist, so I don't want to weigh into an area that I don't know much about, but it seems to me that civil society, even in this country, plays a very strong role. I think you still have an American citizenship. I am still an American citizen. Okay. <laughs> That's his score. Tanisha. Um, so first, congratulations. This is an amazing amount of work. Congratulations on the book. So I have two questions for you. First, if I'm, if I'm remembering one of the earlier slides correctly, there's an interesting um, contrast between what leaders of NGOs think the public thinks of them and what the public actually thinks of them um, in terms of levels of trust and stuff. And I wonder if you could explain, you know, tell us how you make sense of that. Um, and then second, I was curious what your results are regarding trust levels of international um, mm -hmm. NGOs or international human rights organizations as opposed to the local human rights. Okay. Um, so yes, NGO leaders are much more pessimistic about what the population thinks of them than the population is itself. Why might that be? Two possibilities. Uh, one, the general, the NGO population, the NGO leadership population doesn't get out in the general population very much. In part because they get a lot of aid from overseas, but in part also because their work just doesn't take them out into the general populace as much as it should. And so they just simply don't have contact with large numbers of people, and they're systematically excluding from their from their kinship and from their professional networks, they're systematically excluding important chunks of the population. So that's one possibility, just poor information, or information, biased information, or imperfect information. Another variant of that, I think, is to say that they spend most of their time in, in kind of advocacy, hand-to-hand -hand combat with the government and with civil society critics, and so their view is skewed by that really intense debate that takes place in a national capital. But <coughs> that debate, at least in the countries you look at, doesn't seem to percolate out to the general population. And so they have a skewed view, not because they don't socialize with other people, but because their work puts them in direct conflict with critics all the time. That's what they do every day, and so they get jaded by that perspective. Those are the two options that I thought of. Um, we do find that when we present data to NGO leaders, the one, the stuff that they're most interested in is the gap between their perception and the population's perception. And I've noticed now that there's there's actually a fair number of other researchers who do stuff like this. I noticed one in Colombia did this very interesting study where they asked the owners of um, mining companies, the owners and managers of mining companies, what they thought the population thought of them, and then they asked the population what they thought of the mining companies. And there were some pretty important discrepancies, um, in fact, in the mining company's favor. So there was more positive feeling towards the mining companies than the mining management thought there was. And that may be because, again, they're caught in this kind of really intense debate with their critics, 
but they, they don't go outside that debate very often. Okay, um, your second question was um, international. And we found that it flipped. Uh, international NGOs and local NGOs are like this depending on the country. The differences are not huge. We, we had thought there would be much bigger differences. Um, some, this, this, the, the effects, the statistical effects of the variables we're interested in are much stronger for the local NGOs than they are for the international NGOs. We're able to explain less of the international NGO very the variance. And I think that's because people have even less information and less strong opinions about international NGOs. Does that help? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised that there isn't more correlation between mistrust of the U.S. government, say, and um, levels of trust with international human rights organizations. Yes, we have a piece under review with JPR, and we're dealing with people, probably you're one of the reviewers, and you know, the people are just not buying, and us not buying the argument, and we're, <laughs> So this is our third round, and we're like, no, really, believe us. Um, but, yeah. Yes, sir. Do your, do your findings support any recommendations about how NGOs should, say, change their behavior? Yes. Um, our findings suggest that NGOs should look to figure out how to replace foreign funds with local funds, because there is going to be some interest in doing that, and that that will have other beneficial effects. More contact leads to more trust, more contact leads to better knowledge, more contract, contract would lead to a more diversified funding base, and more resiliency in the face of government crackdowns. So we were very um, pleased to see that the Open Society Foundation, which is one of the leaders in the funding of civil society, took, first of all, they paid for our research, and then when they saw the results, they decided to make a change within their own program, and they've opened up a new program, which gives money to NGOs to build to do local constituency building, and that's a change that just happened right now, and I consider that a professional win, uh, and that's exciting. Yes, Actually, Jessica is waiting. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you could say more about differences among the countries in your survey, and whether you uh, you mostly presented kind of an overview of all of them. But yes. I noticed in some of the graphs there were some pretty considerable differences. Like there are Nigeria some differences. Nigeria had like very high levels of mistrust of <coughs> domestic authority. Nigeria is very high mistrust of domestic, and is much higher trust of the U.S. and of MNCs okay. yeah. than uh, other countries. Nigeria is, is always a bit of a challenge empirically. Um, Maybe I'll talk about one of the most interesting differences, which was in religiosity. In, we tend to have this view that religiosity has a, um, a uniform impact on views on human rights. That the more religious you are, the less pro-human rights you are. And we're usually thinking of something around reproductive rights, or maybe we're thinking about LGBT rights. Um, but what we found is a strong difference between some countries, in fact, an inverse relationship. So, for example, in, Mor in Morocco, if you attend the mosque frequently, you tend to be an opponent of human rights. But that's different than your personal religiosity. So only about 50% of the population attends mosques religiously, and it's not just men, it's men and women together. Um, those who are personally religious, and most Moroccans are personally religious, are, they can be supportive of human rights. But when you go to the mosque, that is associated with a pretty substantial drop in your support for human rights organizations and human rights language. In Mexico, it's the exact opposite. Um, the more you attend religious service, whether it be Catholic or evangelical, the more likely you are to be supportive of human rights ideas and organizations. So there's a whole book to be written on the differences, but we, in this book we were going for the similarities rather than the differences. Because the, from the similarities, you can start generalizing. From the differences, you get mired in kind of comparative politics. Yeah, uh, but you have this interesting we do. data across We do. We wanted to... to do better with the differences. We want more countries, yeah. so that we can be. We don't want it to say here four countries that are different from each other. We want to say here are Latin American countries that are different than African countries that are different than. And so we need more cases. So right now we have plans to do this work in the U.S. We have a U.S. survey that we hope to start in the next six to eight weeks, um, which has a substantial oversample of what we call persuadables, people who are Republicans but who could be, but who's whose stance on human rights is, is a little shaky. And so we try to identi first identify those people and then oversample them and do message testing on them. Uh, we're doing that work in conjunction with Human Rights Watch and with the Center for Victims of Torture here in town. Um, we have another 
survey that we're doing in Tanzania uh, early next year, which is funded by USAID. There, the, the survey is aimed at establishing the population's priorities for human rights work. And then, um, in theory, USAID is supposed to then use those findings to inform its funding priorities in the country. Whether that actually happened or not, who knows. Don't you? Yeah. Uh, just wanted to know if the uh, interviews or the research was only in urban areas or in rural, rural areas too? So, and uh, if in yes, what was the difference? Um, we found very few rural-urban differences, which really surprised us. It could be that because anywhere <coughs> like Mexico, the rural areas that we chose were in about anywhere from um, 100 to 200 miles of the major city. So we are sampling rural areas, but they're still closer to the, to the big city than not. Um, but in Mexico, we have three levels of residents. We have rural, we have kind of an exurban, and then we have urban. And we don't find substantial differences. That goes to this problem we have. We don't find strong socioeconomic predictors of attitudes. We find that attitudes predict attitudes. We don't find that gender or income or place of residence affects attitudes the way we thought. I was conditioned, not being a survey expert, I was conditioned to think that it was all about where you lived and, and what your income was. And it turns out that, at least on these issues, that's just, that's, that's an oversimplification. Uh, you didn't study it, but you alluded to it briefly. Um, what do you think is the Trump effect? I think the Trump effect is to make NGOs appear more anti-US than they were even before. I think that support will swing <clears throat> behind NGOs even to a greater extent, I think. How would you how would you do something to document to that? find that out? I would Briefly. rerun Brief, you know, I, I mean, would I would go back to I would rerun the same surveys in the same countries uh, now after Trump and see whether <clears throat> the US factor whether the slope of the line, as I said before, the slope of the line should be different. Is there a quick, quick and dirty way of doing it? It sounds like a gross effect to me, not a subtle one. I don't do anything quick and dirty. Um, <laughs> uh, That's probably a bad term of art, but I just made that up. Well, no, it's actually really interesting. I'm, I'm going, next year's my sabbatical, and what I hope to do in my sabbatical is to work with Human Rights Watch to figure out how to use these polls in their own work. And of course, for them, quick and dirty makes sense. For all NGOs, quick and dirty makes sense because they don't have, you know, this is 10 years of work and hundreds of thousands of dollars. They don't have that time horizon or that budget. Um, so I will be working on how to figure out how to do some of this a little quicker and a little dirtier. There is one, um, the, there's one possibility which is either internet or phone surveys. There are companies out there now which can, for a small amount of money, do a survey of all cell phone users in Tanzania, for example, and ask them three questions. And you could do a quick and dirty approximation of this with your three questions. The problem is that it systematically excludes everyone who doesn't have a cell phone. And even though cell phones are spreading, you're still systematically excluding a lot of people. Another option is random intercept internet surveys. Um, there's a company out of Toronto that is working with the group that we're working with, with USAID. And what they do, in countries that have over 50% internet penetration, they randomly pull websites out of a hat and they embed um, questionnaires into those websites. And if you, by mistake, when you're typing in, say, WW New York Times and you make a mistake and you don't say New York Times, but you say New York Times with a one, you might then get that website and then you're asked to participate in the survey, and it's a very short survey of 10 to 15 questions. And because people misdial websites randomly, you hope you're getting, ra you hope you're getting a random sample. Um, you know, again, that's not work that I would publish in scholarly journals. Um, what we publish in scholarly journals is stuff that takes months and months and months of work to do. But I can see that, you know, once you've done, the way I'm pitching this to donors and to NGOs is once you've done a baseline survey, you can do the quick and dirty stuff periodically afterwards to see if there's any changes. But you should have at least one serious study every few years so that you have a, a vague sense 
of where things really lie, and then you can make predictions. So, for example, you could do a you could do a major survey, and then you could do that random survey at the same time. You can see what the difference is between the random and the proper survey, and then you can take that gap and you can extrapolate by just doing the intercept surveys, say over five or six year periods. Understand what I mean? I think we're just about out of time. Uh, is there somebody else with a question? Uh, go ahead, and this will be the last one. So, as you look forward to you know, the natural evolution of the work here and the things that you just mentioned a minute ago. Are you able to say what the, what I would call the so what questions to be answered are, you know, moving forward? You know, I mean, where, where do you lead? I asked the question about, uh, you know, so would you, uh, based, uh, based on your findings, would you recommend that uh, NGOs change their behavior, you know, somewhat? And you had a good, I thought I would answer that. So are there more of those kinds of so what questions? Yeah, I'll give you some uh, other you examples. Yeah. Um, we're doing one in the U.S. survey in which we ask people, we tell people uh, torture is bad, but then we vary the spokesperson who says that torture is bad. Sometimes we say the spokesperson is um, <coughs> an international human rights organization like Human Rights Watch, and sometimes we say the spokesperson is religious clergy from your religion. So we, we can know ahead of time if the person is uh, Christian, if they're Catholic, and so we say Catholic leaders. And we're going to be able to tell whether it's more effective to appeal to Catholics by saying that Catholic leaders say that torture is bad than by invoking either international law or American values. And that's actionable intelligence, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, in fact, you know, the whole world of political message testing is now open to NGOs. They've never done this before. The only ones who've really used sophisticated message testing is the is the same sex campaign, same sex marriage campaign. They were very sophisticated, but that's a that's a rarity. Um, up until now, the big donors have never given money to NGOs to do survey work, polling work, and message adjusting and message testing. And I think now that's changed. We've got USAID and OSF, Open Society Foundation, doing that, and Ford has been giving us money for a while now, and they've ask that some of that money be moved over to the message testing. So I think um, I think there's a good future for this. But what we're really doing is we're rediscovering the wheel of political polling, but using it, or social advertising, but using it for NGOs. That sounds like a very big deal to me. I, I think so, thank you. Well, on that, uh, that exciting note, <coughs> and thanks very much.